All right, we're here in the creek once again after months and months. And Hi there's guys. Leticia, she's feeling better. Water's a little bit cold on her feet, but she's found a big old chunk of flint here. If you go ahead and pick that up, baby, what is that? Mm, looks to me like a piece of an arrowhead, but maybe a scraper. Looks like something broke in half. Oh, I know. Yeah, it's a scraper. scraper. See, that? See the percussion flakes on the edge? It's a nice little piece, though. Nice little scraper. We just got in the creek, so hopefully we'll find some Whole points today. Just happy to be back in the creek. Look at that. Is that a footprint? No. It's an old deer print. Okay. All right, guys. Another beautiful day. We're down here in a creek. See if we can find y'all some points. So, wish us luck. Looks like there's old footprints in here, but you know that don't really mean much. Off we go. Okay guys, we've been walking for a few minutes. I already walked upon this. Can you guys see that? Yeah, I got one, baby. You see it? Well, the water's coming up there right now. Yep, I see it. Oh, that's pretty. Yeah, oh, that's wow. Cool. So let me get a picture of it. Take a step to your left, please. There you go. That was pretty. Is it broke? Good job. Thank you, baby. So I can get a picture of it. It's a promising start to the day. And we just keep going. Excellent. As is usual, Latish is way behind me again. And I've walked up on something right here. I hope it's something. If y'all can see that. Get out of the light. Well, it's gonna be hard to do. It's definitely an arrowhead. I don't know whether it's whole or not. We're gonna find out together though. Here we go. Come on, baby. Oh, yes. Oh, wow. That's a smoker right there. Nice. There's Letitia. So that's my second one. Haven't been here but a couple of hours. Man, oh man. Creek walking season is back open. Another big old piece of flint right there. You guys see that? I found one! Beautiful. All right, it's a couple hours later. We didn't have any more luck. 
in the other creek. The water got really deep, so we decided to change creeks. So, found two so far. Fish hasn't found any. Everyone take note of that fact, okay? All right, here we go. I just want to show everybody how pretty this creek is. It's really beautiful. Big trees everywhere that the farmers have left. Amazingly. All this rock. I'm going to look this over really good. I'm sorry if the camera wanders a little bit. I'll take some water this time. Okay. I was hoping maybe we'd see a big old a hawk or something fly in. Raccoon or deer or something? Raccoon. Yeah, there's a raccoon, honey. I think it's deer and that's a raccoon. Right. Deer and coon. Some big trees that's falling in, falling down right there. Oh shoot. Holy crap, I think I found something. Ah! Oh. I'm falling in. Oh baby, look. Look, look, look. Oh, oh my it's a tip. Gosh. It's definitely a tip. Hold on, let me take oh, a picture. Oh, I'm in such deep water. Oh, oh you sorry. just muddied it up. I can't help it, I was falling in the water. Oh my goodness gracious. I can't, I'm not going to be able to take a picture of it in C2. So go ahead and pick it up. Let's see if it's whole. Please be whole. Please be whole. Please be whole. Oh my gosh. Oh, it is whole. Oh. Oh, wow. That. Let me get it in the light. Look at that beautiful point. Come on up here. <laughs> Look at that. That's a, that's an Adena there. Oh, oh my look gosh. Look at the coloring on it. Let me get some pictures. Hold it in your hand. Let me, Let me get, get it rinsed off. Wow. Oh, my goodness, we're taking the water. Okay, flip it over. Look at that. Patina. Oh, look at the point. It's got the needle point oh on there. Let me, take, let me get a picture. Okay, sorry. I'm shaking like crazy. Wow. Well, there you go, honey. There's your first one. Hi, hi. As usual, it's better than both of the ones that I found. I was just getting to get out of that hole, too. It was so deep right well, there. You wanted the water. Well, look how deep it is. I know it. Well, wow, that so was good. shining like a diamond. <sighs> okay. Oh, my gosh. That is pretty. It don't look like it it's is. chipped anywhere. It looks perfect to me. Look at that needle. Needle tip. I can't right believe there. that's still there. Wow. Okay. I'm shaking like crazy. Okay, let's put that up and keep going. All right, All right guys, we're having an amazing start to really what's it, what amounts to the opening day of creek walking season. 2024. Oh let's gosh. go. My heart's pounding. Make sure we check this berm good. All right. Don't hang up with them yet. Let's stay on high for just a minute. This berm. All right, we'll, we'll stay on for just a minute. We're not live though, baby. I'm filming. Let you guys see exactly what we, we have to look through. And this is the height that I'm looking. What? No way. Hold on. No, it's not. No way. Make sure. It's not. 
No. Oh, I don't look at it though. No, that's just a, uh, a regular rock. Looks like it's got work marks on it. No, it doesn't, baby. Okay. She got excited. She almost found two, her second point, but not quite. All right, I will. Have faith in me. You guys see anything that I'm missing? Please be sure and point it out in the comments section. And we will come back and get it. We will come back and get it. This. No, just a rock. Get in the creeks like this, you're looking for a little sliver of rock amongst trillions Shining and trillions like of other rocks. So you have to look for any incongruity to the other rocks, like work marks or holes or grooves or sharp edges. And we're especially looking for triangular shaped points right almost every point is some type of triangle so all right baby i'm gonna cut this off and look i need to pay attention to what i'm doing here so not only do you find arrowheads in here you also find treasures like this this is a really old bottle. Bart just cleaned it out for me. It was full of mud. It's a cork top bottle. All right, look at the bottom of it. You see that 20? That indicates I'm pretty sure the year it was made. So that would be 1920. So this bottle is 124 years old. And it's in perfect shape. Except missing perfect. The, of course missing the cork. So yeah, you also find little... Uh, treasures of Americana like that not just arrowheads that's beautiful honey that's a it's beautiful in bottle. perfect shape I don't think I've ever seen one like that really I haven't either how it tapers at the bottom anybody have any idea what that kind of bottle is where it, might have been, it has no maker's mark except for the 20 there's okay. nothing else let's stow that away we're making our way back out of the creek now. I think we're gonna I think we're gonna have time to maybe hit one more creek. The tish is one behind on the arrowheads. But the one she found was really, really beautiful. Hang on, there might be an arrowhead right here behind your foot. Really? I don't know. Could be. Please do not let me be stepping over no arrowheads on camera. Don't move, okay? Right. <laughs> no. No. Okay. Heading on, and maybe another another creek. This one's a very small creek, and we didn't go back in it very far. We might decide to go to Dixon and hit one of those big, huge creeks out there that we have permission to look in. This one's just too mucky. Yeah. Okay. So. Hopefully we'll get back with you guys soon. The day's not over yet. Okay guys. It's our third creek. We found something in the two previous creeks. Hopefully we'll find something in this one too. You can see this is a much bigger creek than the first two we were at. Yeah, it's a lot clearer too. So yeah. much easier to see something. Well, it's not as see. much slate and shell. Yeah. That other one, if, I had, if it hadn't been shining the way it was, I'd probably never seen it. It was just right there on that washed off right. rock. And if it had been gray or brown, mm -hmm. flint, you'd probably have never seen it. Mm -hmm. But it was bright orange, so. And it stuck out. Let's see if we can find one that sticks out here. Right, I'm ready. Where are we going? All right, guys, creek number four. That way or this way? No, we're going this way. We didn't have any luck at all at this 
third creek. So this will be our last stop today. As you can see, the farmers have had all the trees along this creek banks removed on both sides. So. But this is Heartbreak Creek. Hopefully, we'll do some good. Again, hearts will get well. Another one falls. Hate to see it. So far, we found nothing but one little speck of flint in this creek. Tish found that about an hour ago. We've been here an hour, an hour and a half. Doesn't look too good. We got a little daylight left though, so we're going to keep going. Well, I've already told the fisher to turn back, turn around and head back to the car. I walked on up a little further. I had no luck. Doesn't look like we're going to be able to find anything in this creek today. Heartbreak Creek has broke our hearts. That's okay. We'll be back. Visibility is a little bit better. Well, I still haven't caught up with the fish. She must be walking pretty fast. Need to catch up to her, make sure she doesn't run any snakes or anything like that on the way out. Up in these creeks, I probably went a little bit too far on ahead. So, you guys have a great day. I'm gonna put this phone down and try to catch up with this. There she is. All right. Breathe a little sigh of relief now. Be catching up with you guys later. Somewhere up a creek. Hello everyone, thanks for being here. I'm in the woods across from my house. There's a new tree arch that just appeared there not too long ago. It wasn't here the last time I was in here. It's a beautiful day. I'm gonna try to get some emails shared with you guys.
sand in the woods right across from my house, so not really far out or anything. So it's all the for any noises you might hear. A little bit windy, but not too bad. Yeah, this, this should do nicely. Hey again, everybody. Airplanes. Well, it's been a strange past couple of weeks. Um, wild ass neighbors. Exploding transformers. I apologize, guys. I'm less than a mile away from Highway 60. I know it looks like I'm in the middle of nowhere, but I'm literally surrounded by civilization right now not far away so uh, you might hear vehicles and such dogs whatever um, our TV remotes and phones seem to be taking on a life of their own they have, seem to have a mind of their own now crazy stuff happening there and a couple of weeks ago, Letitia went down to Land Between the Lakes with Sherry Griffey and her daughter. And ever since she's got back home, some strange stuff has been happening here as well. Strange marks in our front yard. Sticks sticking up in the ground. Lights on our home surveillance cameras. Strange lights. There's no way a car came up to that stop sign right there. And we couldn't see it in that top corner. It comes right to our driveway. But you see Dan's? He's got two little sprinkly lights, uh, sparkling lights going through his window. Over yeah. There. I don't Why? know what to make of that. Play it again and let me zoom in on Dan's window. Okay, ready? Yeah.
Now there's the lights. And they're just... Oh, wow. They're anyway, I'm not going to complain about all that. I'm, I'm sure that we're protected from all that stuff. I'm just going to share a few emails on this beautiful day. So let's see the first one. From Crystal. C-R-Y-S-T-A-L. Uh, Crystal has written into us before. I think she's keeping a journal now of the strange things that's happening to her in her life and uh, she's sharing it all with us. Thank you so much, Crystal. The first one's entitled The Triangular Black Box. Grandview Lake is a small man-made lake dammed up in the 70s. The rumor is that the head builder's four-year-old daughter went missing during the construction of the dam. During 2015 to 2019, while I was living near it, I've had strange activity from things. I've had strange activity from things that I cannot explain. From very odd dreams, to lights, to visions, one activity I know to be Sasquatch from stories that I have heard that are similar to what went on at my house. One overcast day, my husband and I had just got back from somewhere, and before we went in the house, we went to see the lake. The dam needed repair, and the lake community was raising the funds to get it fixed, so the water level was way out. The lake floor was too deep with mud to walk out there, so we went on the long dock to check out the water level. I think it was Sunday and I remember everything was green and it was not cold yet but my husband had a flannel on. That reminds me I'm probably a little bit overdressed today. It's warming up quite nicely out here. This was a perfect day to stay indoors and watch something on TV or take on a hobby and no one was in sight. The lake was still and looked like glass reflected the still gray sky. We weren't out at the very end of the dock for more than 10 minutes when I looked up to my right. What the heck is that, I said. My husband turned to look at where I was staring. There, moving silently and steadily, was a black triangle with a corner peaked up so that a flat part was level to the ground below. It moved so slowly, had no motor, no chopper blades, no engines, nothing. It was something out of a sci-fi movie. It was pitch black and I couldn't make anything out on it. It then paused there with us, 30 feet away and 50 feet up from the lake's floor. I felt like it was checking us out. Maybe scanning us? Question mark. Feeling that my privacy was invaded, I was a little ticked off as well as disturbed. This was like a strange drone. <clears throat> Excuse me. It then slowly started away and slightly sped up as it left. We watched it disappear and then turned to each other speechless. What the heck, my husband said. Someone's remote controlling that thing, I said in an irritated manner, merely speculating. We went inside and thought no more about it and never brought it up. I think I tried to tell his family later on, but there was no input put into what it might have been. Thank you, Crystal. The next one's entitled Blood Mountain. And she gives the latitude and longitude. I went on a motorcycle ride along with my brother-in-law and husband in 2014 or 2015. We each were on our own bike and I was bringing up the rear. My husband was in front of me and my brother-in-law was lead. My brother-in-law was used to the windy road that snaked up and over the mountain because when he, because when he Racing it was good practice. Yeah, it's a little typo there, I think. The loop, as it is called, is filled with many hairpin turns, switchbacks, and few stops along the way. Actually, there are no stops along the way, but one. To access the drive, take Highway 60 to Route 180, and then it spits you out onto Highway 129. Blood Mountain is close to Vogel State Park and is the highest point of the Appalachian Trail in the state of Georgia. There are a few AT access, accesses by way of foot traffic that cross the road and it was cool to see a hiker pass through when we stopped at Byron Reese Trailhead parking lot to rest before the longest haul 
down the other side of the mountain. The entire ride was more than I had expected and I didn't eat anything because it sounded like a short trip, but I still had fun. I'm up for a ride anytime to anywhere on my little ragged out 883. But there was something I had experienced on that climb just before we made it to the trail access parking lot. Up the mountain, after tilting up out of a sweeping curve, we were climbing, we were climbing up a straight road and we passed through a dark shadow. The shadow wasn't normal though. It was so strong that I could see that it was radiating into the road from the trees just to my right. There were beings there. I couldn't catch a glimpse of them, but they were peering from around the tree trunks. It was the blackest black I've ever seen. I felt a strong sense of them wanting to snatch me right off my bike. I saw the vision of it. The feelings of malice and twisted mirth saturated the vision. It sent shivers down my spine and I looked over my shoulder as much as I dared on this unknown twisted road and throttled a little harder to not fall too far behind. When we stopped at Byron Reese parking lot, no one mentioned that dark patch on the road just minutes before. I was going to say something about it, but my husband overtook the conversation and veered on. Nothing else took place on the mountain that day. We got out and I thought nothing more of it except at random from time to time, wondering if I really saw that and what that could possibly have been. A co-worker and I were talking about hiking the AT, Appalachian Trail, and how I went on a ride up Blood Mountain on the loop. I told her that it was a little creepy up there and she responded with, there are rumors and stories of werewolves from the people that have houses up there. I was shocked. It then started me to think about my ride up there and what happened and what didn't. During my research of the mountain to get the coordinates, I came across I came across that historians, sorry historians, say that the mountain got its name due to a battle between the Cherokee and the Creek. Never mind the fact that there is a Wolf Pen Gap, Wolf Creek, Slaughter Gap, and Slaughter Creek on that mountain, but that's probably coincidence. Right. Sorry to hear y'all are getting harassed. I hope this stops soon. You guys are tough. You can take them, I'm sure of that. Thank you, Crystal, for that vote of confidence there. I'm not, I'm not sweating anyone. Uh, they can harass all they like. It doesn't bother me one bit. So thank you for those shares. Sure appreciate that. Okay, let's get on with it. This one's from Mary entitled Encounters on the Mountain. My first encounter was September of 2016. I had just bought my house on a major river in the mountains of North Carolina and we were doing some work to the house before we moved in. At the time I was a smoker and had gone out to take a smoke break. I hear a very loud scream in the distance from across the river. I ran in to get my husband. By the time we got back outside, the house across and down the river had all their outside lights on. It looked like a spaceship had landed on top of the mountain. The scream came from that direction, so I can only assume that they heard it as well. It didn't scream again that night, so we went back to continue working. My second encounter happened in November of 2016. Again, I had gone out to smoke and saw a flashlight beam moving around behind the house in front of mine. That house is directly on the river. I went in and got my husband, my daughter, and her fiance. They came out on the deck and saw the house light that I had seen. We feared that someone was attempting to break into the house. We live in a vacation home community, so a lot of the houses are vacant most of the year. We decided to go ahead and call the police. While we were outside waiting for the police to arrive, a terrible smell came up. It smelled like a decaying animal mixed with rotten trash. My then husband said it was just a dead animal in the woods, but the rest of us did not agree with him. Our argument was that we had been outside for over 45 minutes. Why had we not already smelled it? The wind was calm, so it was very strange. My third encounter happened December of 2016. 
I was outside smoking with my daughter and all all of a sudden we heard what sounded like a large tree falling into the river then we heard loud splashes in the water like something was running across the river it was so dark that we couldn't see the river my ex-mother-in-law came out before going to bed and heard us talking about it at that moment we heard something humming I got up to see if it was someone down the road no one was there let me remind you that we are only five we are one of only five families that live in the subdivision year-round during the winter months we see very few people it was very disturbing January 2017 it happened again to her and her stepbrother they got up and went outside my fourth encounter happened in May of 2017 my husband and I separated my best friend came to visit she wanted to make sure I was okay late on Saturday night I went to the kitchen to make us some sweet tea I would say it was about 2 30 a.m. my kitchen window was open and I heard something breathing in the breezeway outside the window we have bear up here but I hunt bear and I'm very familiar with the wildlife in our area this was not a bear this was not a bear the volume of air moving through its lungs was massive I went in, went in and asked my friend to come to the kitchen and stand at the sink which is in front of the window she heard it breathing and asked me what the hell is that I told her that I had no idea what it could be she asked me again I told her I really don't know we went back into the living room she was bothered by what had happened she was scheduled to stay until Monday she stayed she stayed up all night and left the next morning I can't really blame her we would hear strange things all the time like something was moving around the house at night I had something tap on my living room window one night I have no idea what it could have been my fifth encounter happened August of 2018 I had remarried and was living in another town about three hours away I decided that I wanted to do some painting so I went up by myself and spent a week working in the house I'd asked my cousin if she wanted to come stay with me she lived about 10 minutes from the house she agreed and came over a few hours after I got there Sorry about that, guys. I would say the third night there, we had finished painting for the day and went outside to smoke a cigarette. We were on the porch singing gospel music as we were both believers in Jesus. About that time, something large came running down the hill towards the house. You could hear the footfalls. This thing was massive. She heard it as well and was trying to pause her phone. It ran all the way down the hill, but stopped before it got to the driveway. I told her that we needed to go in. A few minutes later, she decided that she was going outside to see what it was. We have been raised in the mountains and are not scared of much, so she grabbed a flashlight as she went out the door. I followed behind her. When she got to the end of my pool, when she got to the end of my porch, she put her flashlight on it. I came up behind her and did the same. It was a large black Bigfoot. We went inside and I called my husband. He instructed us to stay inside with all the doors locked. That's funny now that I think about it. If he wanted in, he wouldn't have any trouble doing so. Shortly after that, we were in the living room not talking. I was just trying to wrap my head around what we had just seen we heard a big dog growling on the other side of the house the living room is on the opposite side of the house where the Bigfoot was located we decided to call the non-emergency phone number for the sheriff's office they sent someone out we did not tell him what we saw but he assumed it was a bear after looking around the house and being gone for a while he came back around and told us this I saw him I threw rocks and sticks at him trying to get him to move along Stay in your house. Don't come back out tonight. 
I will stay on this side of the county tonight if you need me. As I leave, I will use my light to move him along and away from your house. Hopefully he will not come back. My cousin ran into him a year ago. She asked him if he had seen a Bigfoot. And he dropped his head and said, yes, I did. He is no longer employed at the Sheriff's Department. He quit shortly after the encounter. I have more encounters, but thought I would start with these. My sister-in-law had several encounters while visiting as well. I'm sure, we sh I'm sure she would be glad to talk to you. Thanks, Mary. Thank you, Mary, for sharing that. We really appreciate it. All right, what we got now? Okay, this is from South Force 10. Um, this is his email that he sent in before he appeared on my live stream. So, hello, my friend. I go by South Force 10 on YouTube. I've watched many of your videos and I'm also subscribed to your channel. I enjoy watching you because I can tell you're a straight shooter. The good guys on here are hard to find and getting even harder. Let me tell you a little about myself. I'm 54 years old and live in the world's largest parking lot called Pigeon Forge, Tennessee. I try to stay out of the city as much as possible. I was raised back in the woods, so to speak. I was passed around to all my kinfolk growing up. My mom spent most of her life in and out of hospitals and then died when I was 16. Sorry to hear that, brother. My dad was a truck driver, so that is why I was passed around to all my aunts and uncles. This is how I came about hearing all this folklore that I pass on. Now, there's a darkness that hangs over that side of the family. It is something that they were all too ashamed to ever talk about with outsiders. I was ashamed to talk about it until a few years ago. I can remember my granny and the rest of them warning me that I would experience things in my life and I was to remain quiet about them or it would get worse. I get chills just typing this. I would hear things and see things that shook me to the core. I would pray to God when these things would happen because I knew it was not God doing these things. No, it's not. My family came from the deep mountains and believed in things like curses and warnings and the whole world of things the outside world didn't know about. My granny said someone in our bloodline was able to look into this other world at some point and that is why these things happened to us. My mom said someone years ago cursed our bloodline. I don't know what happened, I just know it is real. Now as I have gotten older, it has slowed down and even stopped at times in my life. There are times when I feel like there is something evil around me reaching out. I sometimes catch things in pictures I take or catch an EVP. But sometimes I will see something and it feels like it is saying, I haven't let you go. I'm still here. My son is 25 years old and he has had a few things happen to him over the years as well. Nothing like what I had. I feel like a fool talking about this sometimes. Like people think, you're a grown man, what is the matter with you? I know that me and Jesus know what I have seen. Sorry for all sorry for all that. I guess I felt like I needed to get that off my chest. I know you know about things that can't be explained. I never meant to drop all this on you first time I talked to you. Well, that's fine, I'm glad you did. Now about feral men. Yes, my uncles would tell me that them and my grandfather and a few of their neighbors would get paid cash for every body they could bring in. This would happen two or three times a year. Different uncles would tell me about what happened when this, with this when they were young. The feds knew the park was going to, to be a huge hit someday, and they could not have these things in the park. I believe the last hunt was in the early 60s. They used to talk about one of those things getting someone one day, and then the park will have to do something about them. It is true that park rangers told them what happened to Dennis Martin. I also had a ranger tell me this is what happened to Dennis. These things were never thought of as paranormal in any way at all. More of a nuisance. I should have never referred to them as feral men. They are more like feral beings. My kinfolk always thought of them as an abomination of a man's sin. You can kind of see where that is going. 
Thank you for letting me have your ear and letting me reach out to you. This is my work email. I can only read emails I get here when I'm at work. Monday to Friday. Feel free to read this email to your wife or anyone else. All I ask is that you don't read this next part to anyone. That part is for just you and your wife to know. All right, thank you, South Force. Appreciate you sending that email in to me. Um, did an outstanding job on the, on the live stream. So, welcome to the family. Okay. Let's see what we got here. This is from Danny in Kentucky. This story was told to me by my late father who was a lifelong resident in the area. I grew up a short walk to Lake Barkley. When I was young my dad was telling me how the lakes were made. Those very lakes surround LBL. The entire area was taken by eminent domain and those affected were not happy despite what the Kentucky state government said. Granted, the majority of the land was farmland, but regardless, people lost their land. The method chosen was that a few structures were relocated, but most were just bulldozed. Houses laid flat, trees fell, and roads blasted just enough for boats to pass. However, the debris was not removed. Instead, it was left where it lay. You will notice that LBL is peppered with cemeteries, and the ground that is beneath the lakes was the same. They relocated those cemeteries, but they missed some. My, my memory fails me if it was the formation of Kentucky Lake or Lake Barkley, but they did miss some. Not long after the area was flooded, caskets began to wash ashore. As if that wasn't horrific enough, due to the water, the lids of most of the caskets were opened. The corpses within all displayed the same disturbing characteristics. Regardless of sex, the hair and fingernails of the deceased were extremely long. Their limbs were in contorted positions. The most disturbing part is that the lids of the caskets had scratch marks on them. The narratives given was that the embalming techniques were lax back then. Hair and nails can continue to grow post-mortem, yes they can. As bodies, as bodies decompose, gases can develop that would cause involuntary muscle movements. LBL is an extremely active paranormal area, but no one examines why. Evidently you haven't been watching my uh, videos, Danny. Land taken by force, desecration of holy land, could be the perfect formula for not the creation of a recreational area, but the grounds for the birth of a beast. Countless other paranormal encounters have been experienced as well. I hope you weather the second winter of Kentucky well. We're in for a spring of deception before the third Kentucky winter, is, winter appears. Danny. Blessings unto you, Danny. Blessings unto you as well, Danny. And he sent a couple of emails here. Let's see what the second one says. This experience occurred in the mid-1980s and I was around 10 years old. All of our summer vacations had a camping trip to LBL. This event occurred at Hillman Ferry Campground. Our campsite was on the edge of that area. The campsite was a bigger one as it was my family, my aunts and uncles family. The site itself was a triangular shape. The layout was thus. The area of the site closest to the woods had the boys and girls tents. The area across the site had pop-up campers for my parents and my aunt and uncle. The girls' tent housed my two much older sisters and my cousin. The boys' tent housed myself, my two cousins who were close to my age, and my oldest sister's boyfriend who was probably around 16 at the time. Our tent was rather large and was situated parallel to two large trees. It should be noted that my parents strung up a clothesline between those trees in order to hang beach towels and sheets so they could dry after a day at the beach. In the middle of the night, we were awoken by our tent shaking violently. I remember waking up while lying on my back and I was frozen in fear by the shaking. 
The only sound was the noise of shaking. Then my youngest cousin began to scream. Then we all joined in. My dad was the first to exit their camper yelling, what in the hell is going on? I saw the light of his flashlight and at that exact moment, the shaking stopped. He asked what happened and we told him all at once. He immediately told everyone to calm down as it was probably a deer who got caught up in the tent. He then said that it's over and to go back to bed. End of story. When the 1980s dad said that, then it was certainly the end of the story. As we tried calming from the event, I peeked through the screen of the tent and saw the comforting sight of my dad and uncle restoking the fire. They spoke to each other with only in hushed voices. I also noticed that when they settled down into chairs, each had their pistol resting on top of their legs. If it was just a deer, then why stay up the rest of the night armed? It took me forever to fall back asleep, as fireside stories of the werewolf and LBL were ever present in my mind. Myself and the rest of the occupants of the boy's tent were first awake just after dawn. My sister's boyfriend was first outside of the tent. He said, hey y'all, check this out. We crawled out of the tent and he pointed to the clothesline by our tent. He, he said, sorry guys for the traffic noise. He said, I don't care what your dad said, but a deer didn't do this. He pointed to the beach towels and sheets hanging on the line. They were all shredded to tatters. It looked as though they were slashed with a knife. There were no signs of damage to the tent other than the stakes in the ground were loose and needed to be reset. As everyone else awoken and gathered at the sight of the shredded linens, my dad repeated, like I said last night, end of story. In fact, that was the end of the story as no one spoke of it again. One more to go, Mark, about the LBL, Danny. Hey, Danny, let's, LBL part three. Bart, let's hop into a time machine and travel from the mid 80s to the early 90s. I'm a teenager now, around the age, six, around the age 16 or 17 years old. As you grew up in the area, then you know that an important part of the weekend is finding a place out of the way to hang out. One of my friends said he found a great spot in LBL. We immediately resisted with saying that there are too many rangers on patrol. He assured us this place was on the northern side before you get to the welcome station. He further said that it was a straight road going in and that we could see any headlights before they saw us. We were convinced and headed there just, a, just after a warm and humid night in the early summer. Heading south on the trace, we followed my friend as he turned left onto a dirt road. Much to our disappointment, the road dead-ended into a turnaround about 15 to 20 feet in diameter. That meant that if we saw headlights coming toward us, then we had to pass whoever it was coming back out. It was the same way coming in as it was coming out. After teasing our friend, his planning was less than to be desired. We decided to stay anyway since it was a haul to get there in the first place. There were six of us and we had secured a six pack of beer so sobriety was assured. <laughs> we settled in the turnaround. It was surrounded by heavy woods and felt fairly secure. We settled in one, in one began, we settled in, one began both listening to music and sip our one and only beer. It was less than an hour later when it happened. Two red lights illuminated on the opposite side of the turnaround of us. They were the exact appearance of tail lights of a car. We froze in silence. How could we not have noticed a car? It was complete silence outside of the sounds of crickets, frogs, and stone temple pilots playing in the background. Suddenly, without warning, the two tail lights shot forward into the woods about 12 feet. No sound was made except one of my friends said, what the F in a whispered voice. We were frozen in place from a mixture of fear and wonder. That silent 12 feet movement occurred without a single sound, even though it moved forward into thick woods. Less than a minute later, the two lights shook for a moment and grew brighter. Then without warning, the lights suddenly shoot away in the opposite directions from one another, 10 to 12 feet. We still watch frozen in place. 
Now the lights were approximately 24 feet apart. Yet again the lights began to wobble. This time there was a sound. It was the sound of reverb before you plug a guitar into an amp. Heard this how many times? It was deafening and as the sound hit its peak the lights turned to sickly green and then wildly raced through the woods, bouncing wildly along the way. The lights were gone and we decided to leave with haste. We gathered at a late diner called the Pelican in Lake City to recall our experience which everyone experienced. Half the group was terrified, vowing never to experience that again. However, myself and two other friends were hooked. We wanted more paranormal activity and swore we would seek out that experience again. We would, but just not in the LBL again. Cue the X-Files theme song, but we were hooked on having paranormal experiences and that we would. All right, thanks, Danny. Thanks for those shares, man. Uh, yeah, anyone who's been watching this channel knows all about the LBL, its history, uh, the creatures there, that we appreciate you sharing your knowledge and your experiences. Okay. What we got here? from Sonya Thrower. Six five six seven Kentucky Highway one eighty five Bowling Green, Kentucky. Four two one oh one. That's where I live. Been here a little over a year. I'm from Tennessee but my first encounter with Bigfoot definitely have seen other stuff in Tennessee and here I have so many stories starting from when I was about 10. I guess that's as far back as I can remember. I think I'm pretty sure there are three possible Bigfoot, two grown ones, definitely smaller. I guess the child, I've seen some black creatures with horns. The other night there were orbs, some kind of weird lights. My boyfriend has heard this creature. We all have, but I'm the only one that has seen them and I have tons of pictures. I've seen it. And last night, Sunday the 11th, we heard it's howl again. We got some blurry pigs of what might be him, possibly more than one. Okay, Sonya. Um, let's show these pigs to everyone. I'm not sure if they can make it out or not. Kind of figure standing behind a tree there. And the other picture is just the same one, not zoomed in. Okay, thanks, Sonia. Um, sounds like you and me need to talk. This is from Sue G. Hi Sue G. Thank you for writing in, hon. Hi guys, I had some trouble posting this comment on the show with South Force 10, but I really wanted to make sure you saw it, and maybe you can pass it on to him for me. Thank you, Sue G. I really like to hear South Force, South Force 10's and everyone's thoughts on this. On April 1st, 2017, the following link story was reported. The next day it was reported that the whole thing was an April Fool's Day prank perpetrated by the DNR. Personally, I never knew the DNR had such a mischievous sense of humor. I know the pictures are said to actually be from a place in Turkey, but I think in Roswell style, this story was initially reported, then they tried to cover it up. What do y'all think? And she sent a link here. About a centuries old city discovered beneath Cades Cove, Tennessee. So let's
let you guys check this out. You can go to this website and read this story and tell Suji what you think of it. Thank you, Suji. I'm sure South Force 10 will check that out and, and get back to us uh, without delay. Let's see what else we got here. This is from Danita Whitson. <laughs> Hello, Danita. Nice to see you in chat uh, on the live stream. Okay, this is a very busy guy way up here above me evidently. Danita says, I've had to stop and start hearing your mysterious Kentucky Volume 1 Hidden History Part 2 Giants in Kentucky. Had Part 1 going but gone and cannot find. Anyway, sorry, the question in all of your research and interviews with involved individuals, have you ever said when they stopped? Being moved to to carve, to paint, to set up monuments, rock formations. What happened that they stopped carving and painting the things they saw that were happening in their lives? Yes, of course, it could be the invasion of white people. I get that. But wouldn't you still do it a bit closer to our time than ancient? Nothing negative, just curious and amazing work not being continued somehow. Thought maybe someone you met or spoke to may have said why they just don't do it anymore. Actually, no, that's a, that's a pretty good question and a mystery, Danita. Uh, many of the, uh, the ancient petroglyphic sites in Kentucky and the pictographic sites, uh, the, later, the later Indians did not know who made those works of art. So not only is it a mystery why they stopped doing it, doing it but it's also a mystery who did it in the first place, at least in some instances, not in all, but in some cases. I'm going to read you this. It's an actual letter written in. The second one. Okay, sorry guys. Had to change out the battery and the camera. Okay, so we got a letter here, another letter, the second letter from Miss Gina Cook. And thank you so much, Gina. So, so nice to see that people still write letters with their ink pens, not a keyboard. Dear Bart and Letitia, just a few quick words to extend my appreciation for the acknowledgement of the letter I wrote you. It was truly an unexpected, pleasant surprise. You're so welcome. Gina, thank you for writing it. Not long afterward, I mailed in my cousin's encounter along with two handmade angels I made for y'all. I was hoping he received everything before Christmas. I also wanted to send you my email address in case y'all needed or wanted any more information. His email, newspaper articles, etc. Please feel free to contact me through my email. Once again, thank you for the time you take to help those who have no one to turn to for help. Y'all are blessings to those around you. Thank you, your friend from Trigg County, Kentucky, Gina Cook. Thank you, Gina. And here's her cousin's experience, I take it. Okay, let's see what we got here. Back in mid-1988, June, I believe, I received a phone call from my mom. She was checking up on me. I was living in Dyersburg, Tennessee, and was pregnant with my youngest child. During our conversation, she brought up the fact that my cousin, Robert Ryman, hope I pronounced that right, Bobby Joe, quote unquote, had an encounter with the big muddy monster. Wow, both my parents 
were born and raised in Southern Illinois. My mom in Murfreesboro and my father from Grand Tower. Much of our family still resides there. Well, getting into the story, earlier that week, Bobby Joe and his security guard, Charlie Straub, off duty from neighboring county, were working late one evening at the auto salvage yard when Charlie radioed Bobby Joe about a possible intruder. He and Bobby began investigating when they happened upon an 8 to 10 foot tall, white, off-white, shaggy, muscular being. White to off-white, shaggy, muscular being. Charlie asked if he should shoot in which... Charlie asked if he should shoot in which Bobby replied, make Mongo mad. And they retreated to the top after the creature roared. Retreated to the stop after the creature roared. Bobby contacted his wife, who was over at his mother's, to inform them of the encounter. Bobby's sister Joyce and mom showed up at the auto yard, thinking the guys were joking. Only to have the creature begin beating on the side of the building. Wow, that must have been very frightening. When the Bigfoot finally retreated back down through the woods to the river, they were able to get the police and sheriff's office out to investigate, along with students from the SIV campus. There was apparently casts of tracks taken, as well as hair samples. Looking into past stories, two from the 70s, two couples had terrifying encounters, two teens who, who were forbidden from dating and married a couple, both married, I'm sorry, two teens who were forbidden from dating and one, and a married couple, both married to other people, uh oh, had encounters on the same night, both turned it into authorities, risking being exposed for their sneaking around. I want to thank you. What's, that's a very compromising position, wouldn't it be? I want to thank you for the appreciation you showed for something as simple as a handwritten letter. I believe that many have forgotten what it means to receive mail that was handwritten from a loved one or dear friend. Indeed they have, Gina. I have written down what I recall of my cousin's encounter that I have enclosed with this short note. Also for further experiences, or for further references, he has appeared in two Bigfoot docu-films. Monsters and Mysteries in America, The Big Muddy Monster. Well, that's the same show that I was on. Uh, same series, not the same episode. And The Creature from the Big Muddy in Illinois Bigfoot Legend. I've put together two angels that I hope you all enjoy. And thank you for making this 56-year-old Nana part of your family. Your friend Gina Cook. Thank you, Gina. And those two angel Christmas ornaments were so beautiful. I didn't want to bring them out here in the woods with me for fear that I might drop them or damage them in some way. But we really appreciated that. It's really touching that you would take the time to do all that for us. We appreciate all our viewers, our YouTube friends and family. You guys are the greatest. Uh, I have a few more emails to read, but I'm running out of time here. Have some things to do today. So we'll cut this off for now, and uh, there, there'll be another video coming along soon, I'm sure. Um, got a lot of exciting stuff still coming in and that I'm still working on and talking to people about. So uh, be sure to check and see that you're still subscribed if you're a subscriber. A lot of uh, a lot of subs been coming up missing here lately and we all know what that's about so don't let one of them be you hit that notification bell and you'll know when I drop a video or do a spontaneous live like we've been known to do so that's about it for today everybody thank you for being here we love you guys God bless you guys and remember don't be scared be prepared. See you next time.